Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Turn the Page. I'm your host today, Jen, and I am joined by a fantastic writer of uh, historical fiction tinged with fantasy, tinged with speculative elements, all sorts of really interesting genre bendy type things happening. And I am so excited about this book as a as a professed medieval nerd. So let's hop right into it. Thank you so much for joining us. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book today, please? Absolutely. Uh, hi, I'm Kate Hartfield. I'm really happy to be here. I am a Canadian writer. Um, a lot of historical fantasy, as you say, a lot of mixed genres, uh, mostly historical settings and usually with something weird going on. And the new book is called The Tapestry of Time. And it's about four clairvoyant sisters in World War II who are trying to prevent the Nazis from getting control of the Baia Tapestry uh, in the summer of 1944. <sighs> It is so fascinating. You know, and as I hinted at in a, a previous lifetime before I came to libraries, I was a, a medieval historian and I studied the Normans. And so the pitch of this book just grabbed me instantaneously. And it is just as much fun as I was hoping it would be. So could we start out a little bit talking about your journey toward this book? I'm really curious about what the inception point was. Was it a character, an image, or a vibe, perhaps? Like, how did this develop for you? Yeah, this one was a little bit unusual in that there was a single inception point, and it's also a bit of a strange one. <laughs> so it was actually a tweet. It was it was in 2020, and there was this one of those sort of open-ended Twitter questions that was going around, and the question was, what was the first movie you ever saw in the theater? And what was the last one you saw before lockdowns? And what sort of mashup would that create? <laughs> and, you know, just having fun while I was having my coffee one morning, I said, you know, well, I think the first movie I ever saw was Indiana Jones Raiders of the Lost Ark. And the last one before lockdown on my birthday in January 2020, I actually went to see the Greta Gerwig Little Women. So I had Little Women Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I thought, oh, that's that's funny. <laughs> and uh, it sort of took root in my mind, this idea of of these four sisters and these sort of archetypal women, uh, there was something about that that really struck me and and what archetypes do for us in fiction and how they can be prison sometimes as well and, and the way that they uh, shape how we view ourselves as women. That was really interesting to me. And the Indiana Jones bit, I thought, was interesting as well because, you know, we live in a time when rising fascism is a fear and having come up in an age when they were the the movie bad guys. I thought, well, what if we have a look at that again? What if we have a look at that sense of adventure again? Uh, so that's where it started. And this combined with some nonfiction reading that I was doing just for fun about the biotapestry, which really was an object that the, the Nazis really wanted. Uh, and Himmler in particular, uh, we can talk more about that in detail, but, but uh, he really had his eye on it as an object of propaganda and also because he was really interested in the occult and and in history and in the narratives of history and the way that we tell stories and the way that that can be put to political uses was also really interesting to me. So this all was sort of stewing in my mind together. It all started with this uh, quite silly tweet, but um, it, it turned into something darker and more serious as it went along. That's probably the most good work a tweet has ever done. So very... probably, probably <laughs> I'm not on Twitter very much anymore, um, you know, but uh, those were the good old days. Yeah. Yeah, I really love that story. And I'm interested if we could, you know, get right into the Nazi occultism, because Indiana Jones was also my entry point for that whole aspect of World War II, which I think I spent most of my childhood thinking was pure fantasy. But yeah, there is a lot of truth to the sort of search for weird artifacts and for things imbued with supernatural power. So yeah, could you talk a little bit about the biotapestry and yeah, the role that it played and how that feeds into your book? Yeah, for sure. So a lot of that history in the novel is real. Actually, pretty much all of the movements of the tapestry, uh, with one exception, are uh, taken from history. And and the way that 
that the Nazis viewed it is, is pretty much taken from history as well with some supernatural elements added on to kind of heighten the metaphor and, and look at it through a different lens. But they were very interested in it. There were a few different Nazi organizations in the bureaucracy that had to do with dealing with art and artifacts in, uh, in Germany and in, in every occupied territory uh, that they came into. And so they had sort of competing interests even uh, within the regime that there were people who genuinely were quite interested in, in making sure that the art was not destroyed uh, there were many many people who were looting of course and stealing particularly from jewish families and there were also these historians and archaeologists and experts that had been recruited for himmler's team of occultists and uh, experts and even though some of them came from quite mainstream academia they they all sort of got pulled into this sucked into this society of developing these weird conspiracy theories and developing these weird historical theories that would justify fascism in their mind that you know i think most people are quite familiar with the idea of an aryan race the idea of race supremacy that that drove a lot of uh, nazi policy or at least was used to rationalize it but as part of that there was this idea of some sort of distant historical golden age that was of course nordic and that there was there was some idea that that it had been a matriarchy but women were the right kinds of women you know back to those archetypes of what women are ought to, ought to be and that there were uh, you know certain powers and forces and and the lost kingdom of atlantis and all sorts of things that got got pulled into this and tibetan occultism and orientalism and basically anything that they could find and and make fit into one of their crackpot theories to try and prove that they were destined by history to take over the world they would put into it and there was also uh, quite a lot of interest in psychic phenomena and in clairvoyance and that kind of thing as well um, Hitler himself kind of soured on that uh, for various reasons um, about partway through his his reign but there were a lot of Nazis who were quite interested in that and, and really believed in a lot of supernatural forces as well. So yeah, so the Indiana Jones thing didn't come from from nowhere. It was uh, it was a real obsession at the time. It's so interesting to me that like as they were attempting to take over Europe and beyond, they were also colonizing the past in a really real way by trying to claim all of these historical heritages and artifacts for their own. And I think that plays such an interesting role in this book in both how it plays into a lot of the characters' pasts and their lives before the war and then the activities that they undertake during the war. So let's talk about them. Let's talk about our four sharp sisters because I love them all so much. <laughs> They're all like, I really deeply care about all of them. I'm in a very intense uh, parasocial relationship with all of them. So can you talk about crafting them and their dynamic? Their relationships feel really real and lived in and like sort of loving and warm and, and creaky sometimes in the way that sister relationships are. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really fell in love with all of them as well. And so that's, that's wonderful to hear. So the, the four sharp sisters do have a very varied relationship with history in the past and, and with each other and, and with clairvoyance that they all share and they come to understand throughout the, the course of this novel. And the, the clairvoyance is you know, it's it's partly there because it's fun to write about, but it's also partly there because it helps me talk about things like, how do we know? How do we know what is true? And how do we understand history? And how do we tell those stories to ourselves? And so it uh, it's just a different lens on, on those questions. So their dad, Rupert Sharp, in, in the novel, is a historian. And I should say that this family is made up. There are a few real historical figures in the novel, but most of the characters are invented. And he, so they've grown up with his obsession about the biotapestry um, and his theories about it. And they have different relationships to his work. And Kit, Kit Sharp, who is probably the sister that we see the most of, and we start in her perspective. She followed in his footsteps to some degree. She went into archaeology, didn't really like it. She becomes an archivist working for the Louvre during the war. And she, even though she's English, she stays in Paris during the war because she, for various reasons, partly because she's a lesbian and um, partly because she's fallen out with her father mm -hmm. over different ideas about the past and different the sort of changing theories about anthropology and, and archaeology that were happening at the time in the 40s. Um, so she feels sort of cut off from her family and her home. And so she stays in Paris um, even after uh, the war begins. And so she has this sort of fraught relationship with her father and, and with history, and uh, she loves it. And she has she's doing her own research. But um, 
trying to find her own way as a member of a new generation, uh, as a member of a new generation of historians and trying to find a way forward and, and not repeat some of the errors of the past. You know, I think one of the things that I wanted to get into in this book is the idea that a lot of the theories and, and ideas that did work off into the, the strange occultism of the Nazi movement um, were also being discussed in other countries and by other people as well. And ideas about things like a sort of singular view of anthropology where every culture is moving towards the same end goal, for example, was something that was really prevalent in the generations before Kit's generation. And, and so she was was questioning that and saying, you know, you don't you see how that's also a colonial mindset and that's also in its way supportive of some of the same ideas of, as fascism. So they have this this interest in in history and the other sisters are not academically interested in history at, at all. And so for them, it's it's the sort of weird conversation that Kit and her father share and they're never really a part of. But they end up having a, a sort of, because of the, the visions that they have and, and the work that they're doing during the war, they end up having a relationship with it anyway. I'm sorry I said Stark girls before. I think the, the news at a Comic-Con just sort of like made its way into my brain. I said Stark instead of, <laughs> so my apologies. <laughs> my, my brain hurt sharp anyway, so it got translated oh, inside right. my brain. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I love Kit. And I really actually love the depiction of her life in Paris at the very outset of the novel. I mean, clearly you've done a lot of research for this novel. You've already talked about that. But I'm very curious about the research in particular on queer life in pre-war Europe. Um, so I think we're most used to hearing about like the Weimar Republic, right? And sort of like the culture that existed there before the rise of the Nazis. But it's less uh, often, I think, that you hear about elsewhere in Europe. So could you talk about that aspect a little bit too? Yeah, that was really fascinating. And um, I did a lot of research into the queer culture and especially lesbian culture in <clears throat> in Paris before the war began. And um, it was was thriving in a lot of ways and uh, it's very sad that the moment the war began is in the moment the occupation came a lot of things shut down that would not that would not reopen for a long time and there were some quite famous uh, women who had to deal with with the threat to their own safety in a lot of ways you know the famous bookstore uh, Shakespeare and Company which is still there today in a, in a different location but is still there and, and is a wonderful place to visit in Paris was run by a queer woman um, who had to sort of go into um, not quite hiding, but she had to just lay low uh, during the war. And there were clubs, you know, like Le Monocle, which I talk about in, in the book, is uh, was a real uh, lesbian club that women would went to. And there are these wonderful photographs um, of women in tuxedos and with, you know, sleek hair and just absolutely gorgeous uh, and, and running the full spectrum. You know, there are butch women there and you know, just having a wonderful time. <laughs> and, and you look at that, and you know, that the moment, the moment the war came, they were, they were so under threat. And they knew that there was, it was, uh, it was quite obvious already that, you know, that, that homosexuals were, uh, were being persecuted and, and killed. So, yeah, so that was something that uh, was really important to me to portray, uh, you know, because I think there is this sense that history, you know, is linear, and is always moving in the right direction. And while I hope that that's true in the big picture, you know, sometimes we do have these these periods where there is there is this efflorescence efflorescence of freedom and and uh, progressive values in a society, and then overnight it can really change. Yeah, it was so fascinating. And it is, I think, a really good reminder, yes, that like history does not always proceed in one direction or in the direction that we would like it to. So a lot of what happens in this novel is based on, the restrictions placed on travel, which I'm sure was like a common wartime experience, especially people involved in the resistance had to get from place to place without really drawing a lot of attention to themselves and to blend in with the occupation. When you were plotting the novel, were you also plotting the movement of all the various characters as that happened? You have the bio tapestry itself moving around a lot and the sisters moving around a lot. Do you physically map things while you are writing or like what is what is your process like? Yeah, that was a tricky one. And for this book, especially, I have to thank my editors, my uh, my developmental editor, Jane, Zon Jane Johnson, and my copy editors and 
and proofreader as well. Yeah, it's uh, it can be quite tricky when you have four characters in different places. And also we have a little bit of a, a flashback. Well, not a little bit, but there's quite a lot of a flashback in the middle of the novel and some backstory that's happening that's informing everything as well. So I had to be quite careful. And the difficulty in writing about World War II, as opposed to some of the earlier periods that I've written about in other novels, is that everything is extremely well documented. Uh, so, you know, every hour, literally every hour of the day during June 1944, we know exactly where the Allies were, where the Germans were. You know, we know a lot about what was happening at the time. So I have to be careful, since I am slotting my story into real history, that that not only my four sisters' movements, but the movements of history are, are all where they ought to be. <laughs> so I do, I do use a lot of spreadsheets and I have a timeline and keep a lot of notes because I'm also a reviser. Uh, so if I revise, then I think, oh, what have I done now? I've got, <laughs> I've got to go and fix something. So the four sisters are in different places. There's uh, Kit, as we mentioned, is in Paris. Ivy, her sister, her younger sister, she we learn very early on uh, in the book, has gone missing. And so she has her own story uh, that, uh, yeah, I'll try not to spoil as well as uh, she's doing some special war work uh, and has gone missing. And the other two sisters, we have uh, Rose, who is working at Bletchley Park, uh, which her family doesn't know, but she's doing some code breaking. And Helen, who at the beginning of the book has been working as a, a land girl in the, the Women's Land Army in England, which is when women would go off and, and work in the fields and, and in forestry and in other industry that the men were no longer able to work in. And that was a little bit of a nod. I wanted to have the four sisters doing different kinds of war work because there were so many and their mother is off doing women's volunteer society work with refugees, which is another thing that a lot of women did. So I wanted to represent some of the different kinds of war work that women did. But also my own grandmother was in the Women's Land Army. And so I wanted to have a little nod to her work. And so that's that's Helen. There's a lot of interesting tension generated by just the fact that women were stepping into a lot of roles that they had not been able to occupy, but that the restrictions and the expectations and the the pressure of stereotyping and what we what we expected of women as a society are still there. And that creates a lot of really interesting character development, I think, right? Because you have characters working against or around the restrictions that have been placed on them. And really interesting plot, uh, because um, you need people to sort of step out of line or to try to do something beyond, you know, in order to kind of get a, a plot rolling. And I really, really was interested in your point about um, how the sources affected your writing. You're absolutely right that um, the war generated a, a huge number of documents in a way that always made me jealous as a medieval historian, because I'm like, I'm working with nothing. Like, what is happening? But having too many sources is really hard, too, because there's a lot of reality that you have to conform to. When you write in other time periods, is there a sweet spot, like an era that you find the easiest or that comes most fluid to you? Yeah, I I really love medieval history as well. And I've written one of my books, The Chatelaine, is set in the 14th century. And the next one that I'm working on right now is also set in the early 14th century. So I, I do like that period and I seem to go back to it a lot. And of course, there's a lot of medieval history that informs the tapestry of time because the biotapestry was made in the 11th century uh, depicting the Norman conquest of England. So yeah, so I love all of that medieval stuff. I've always been a medieval nerd. And so it, it comes into it as well. I love that period. I also seem to return a lot to the 18th century and one thing that's fascinating about that is that you get both of those problems where uh, you have too much and too little, you know. So my novel, The Embroidered Book, is about Marie Antoinette and her sister, Maria Carolina, who is Queen of Naples. And of course, there's so much about Marie Antoinette. And that was the problem is that there's so much that I have, you know, I have three books about her clothing alone. The, you know, everything about her life is documented. And Maria Carolina, for some reason, has not been the subject of a lot of popular history, certainly. Um, so, uh, so I had a, a, the opposite problems where I had too much about one sister and I was just desperate for anything about the other. So depending on the period, yeah, each of them can prevent a, present a challenge to the novelist for sure. Oh, I bet. Oh, especially for Marie Antoinette, I imagine for whom there must have been so much writing that was just highly charged as uh, propagandistic or just meant to, you know, do some other purpose than inform you about who she was. Like, that's a probably really hard to work with in its own way. Yeah, it was definitely. And a lot of the 
uh, conceptions that we have of her come from that propaganda as opposed to actual history. And so when you're writing, you know, you always have to be thinking about what the, what the reader is bringing to the novel in terms of their knowledge as well. And so thinking about, okay, well, what are people's conceptions of Marie Antoinette going to be and how can I work with that and, and, and let them know that maybe there might be something different uh, than they're expecting here. And the same is true with, with the second world war, because, you know, as we've said, it is quite well known in a lot of ways, but I think also there was a question for me as a writer there, because I don't know how much every generation is necessarily going to bring to this this mm -hmm. novel in terms of their knowledge of exactly what was happening in June 1944. And there were a lot of things that, that I didn't know either, even though I had grown up with my grandfather telling me about the war and and I was interested in it. There were lots of things in particular about the last days of, of fascist Paris, uh, the, the, the liberation of Paris that were completely new to me. Uh, so, uh, so always, you know, being aware that not every reader is going to come to this knowing exactly who Heinrich Himmler is or exactly, you know, who was in control of Paris at the time and things like that. It was important for me to keep that in mind. Hmm. Nice. Oh, well, thank you for coming to talk about this book. I found it so much fun. And looking ahead, um, I know that you mentioned that you're writing in the medieval period again. I also saw online that you said that um, this one's going to be your weirdest book since The Chatelaine. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that without revealing <laughs> too much. <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've, uh, we've announced what the book is, so I can talk about it a bit. And yeah, it's, it's called Mercutio, and it is the uh, prequel story of Mercutio, the character from Romeo and Juliet. But um, it's medieval because uh, I'm writing it in the time when the original Montagues and Capulets would have been, which is a couple hundred years before Shakespeare. So it is quite a, an odd book about Mercutio and the poet Dante Alighieri having to deal with an incursion from fairy in, in our world. And so it's all of the things that I love. And it's just, yeah, it's, it's pretty bonkers, pretty wild. And I hope people who love uh, Shakespeare will enjoy it and it is a return to to the middle ages which uh, is always fun for me so yeah so that one is I'm still writing it so it'll be I think 2026 probably before it comes out maybe mm -hmm. I don't know we don't have a date for it yet but 2025 2026 around there well that sounds amazing because I not only love Shakespeare but I love Dante I, I love Dante so much so I'm very excited about that I know it's early to say but if you want to come back to the show to talk about that one our door will always be open to you thank you so much <laughs> excellent I will make a note <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> all right I'll be in touch in 2025 then so <laughs> okay listeners it's your turn now please check out the tapestry of time when you hear this, it will be out in the world. So please head over to your favorite library or independent bookstore, wherever you like to go for those things. And thank you for joining us. It is now time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.